Hey guys, Aaron Boster here, and thanks for learning about MS with me. It is Saturday. Uh, as some of you know, I'm in Chicago for the weekend, enjoying St. Patrick's Day weekend, and I've got a, about a half an hour before I head out into the city again, and I thought I'd use this opportunity to say hello, howdy, hi, to jump on and do a bit of live streaming. Uh, it's my hope that uh, you'll join me for a moment or two. Hello, Matt. Hope you're doing well. Hope your family's doing well. And, and as always, I love hearing from this online community. Many of you know that I have committed to trying to live stream um, more than normal this month. Um, I hope it's not too much. Uh, if it is, definitely tell me in the comments. Um, but I love uh, the idea that we can connect. I love the idea that I can answer your questions. Um, and so I hope that's okay with you guys. I have a half an hour and I wanted to spend it with you. As always, I love hearing where you're from. So as you jump online, do me a favor and say where you're calling in from. Um, I've got uh, April saying hello, howdy, hi. Hello, April. Hello, um, Lori Smith from Detroit. Uh, Lori, I don't know if you know that I did my fellowship training in Detroit at Wayne State University with two amazing MSologists, uh, the late Omar Khan and Bob Lissack. Uh, Detroit is near and dear to my heart. Um, uh, AJHR is on. Hey, what's up? It's good to see you again. Hello, Bruce Owen. Uh, hello, uh, Deborah. Um, I've got Amelia uh, from uh, the UK support group. That's awesome. Um, it's really neat for me uh, that we can reach out through the interwebs and I can grab this online community. I've got Megan online. Megan is a moderator. Uh, Megan helps me out making sure that there aren't goofballs saying inappropriate things on these live streams. Uh, Megan, thank you very much for that. Uh, April, a shout out from Grove City, uh, very close to where I work in Columbus, Ohio. Um, I've got uh, Yvette from Montana. Hello, Yvette. It's good to see you. Um, I've got Jan Janice uh, from Pittsburgh. I've got Debbie from Pittsburgh as well. Uh, Lynn from Michigan. This is fantastic. I love this, guys. Uh, there are 62 people online right now. And I'm going to try to answer some of the questions I didn't get to before. Um, I used to do this a thing that I call the after party, where I would take all the comments that I didn't get to, and I would segment them out. Uh, I would make slides out of them. I would record my answers, and then I would piece them all together in a video. And it would take me a couple hours to do it. Um, and it was really, really cumbersome. And so I, I was kind of sharing with you guys the other day that was hard. And many of you had some great comments. Um, and so I'm going to try reading some of the ones that I didn't get to before and answering them now. Uh, I also want to throw out another thing now. Cameron is online. And Cameron, how are you doing, my friend? Cameron, um, kind of a computer god of sorts, very smart uh, in that regard. And he had a great idea. He said, if we could work out a situation where a moderator could read through the questions on a live stream and then send me specific questions, maybe through a private chat or through some other uh, mechanism that um, I could maybe do it that way. And I really like that idea. Now, um, I, haven't, uh, I haven't yet set that up. I'm not exactly sure how to do that. If any of you have any further thoughts, or, or Cameron, if you have any further thoughts on how we could make that a reality, um, I'm not exactly sure of the software that would be used, et cetera. That's something that I would be interested in uh, because it would be really helpful um, if a moderator was looking through the comments, so, ooh, this is a good one for Dr. B, and then I could read it and answer. Uh, so those are just some, some thoughts that are on my mind. Um, I've got all these people from Alberta, Canada. That's really cool. Hello. How are you doing? Um, now let's try this out. So I'm going to uh, pull up some of the old questions I didn't get to, and I'm going to answer them online right now. And I hope that you guys find this interesting. So the first uh, question is from Selly Tan 7 um, I've got PRMS, and my neurologist advises me to learn the WALS protocol rather than a DMD. Why? So let's unpack that question a little bit. Uh, she shares that she has PRMS, and PRMS uh, stands for progressive relapsing multiple sclerosis. It's a term that is antiquated, and we don't really use it anymore. In fact, it's no longer part of the uh, diagnostic criteria. It would suggest that someone had an attack, and after their attack, they've had a slow, steady decline in function with no further attacks. And again, it's an old term. It's not really used anymore. When someone's had an attack ever, they have a relapsing form of multiple sclerosis. Now, you can have a relapsing form of multiple sclerosis where you don't have very frequent attacks or almost never, or you could have a relapsing form of MS where you used to have an attack, attacks back in the day and, and now you don't. Um, you, you could have a relapsing form of MS where you have attacks all the time. They're all relapsing forms of MS. 
But the reason I bring this up is because it's possible that your provider is thinking, ooh, progressive relapsing, this is kind of a progressive form of MS, and so treatments aren't appropriate. And maybe, and I'm inferring a lot here, maybe the provider says that because they're, they're recommending a, a diet because they don't think there's anything to treat uh, your condition. And in my opinion, that's inaccurate or incorrect. Um, again, this is my own opinion, and I can't really comment about you, of course, on the interwebs without looking um, at your chart and taking your history and doing your exam and looking at your MRIs. But I don't agree with that at all. And it's my opinion that if you have a, a form of MS, then you should be on treatment. Now, I've recently done several videos on diet and nutrition. Um, I don't particularly love Dr. Walls' protocol. I, I do not think that she has cured MS as she claimed in her book. That's a, a fallacy, and it actually makes me very upset uh, that someone would use their degree to sell false hope. But I do think that paying attention to diet is important. And if we consider the Walls protocol as like a modified paleo diet, I don't think there's anything wrong with that, particularly as it may help with energy. But I don't think it should be done in isolation. I certainly don't think that the Walls protocol or any diet replaces the need for a disease-modifying therapy. So um, it's possible that your provider is, is using arcane old concepts and thinks that they can't impact your disease uh, by using a disease-modifying therapy, and I would say, no, -uh, that's not true. Um, I certainly would recommend that you be on a disease-modifying therapy. I would also recommend that you pay attention to eating healthy. And if you guys haven't checked out my most recent uh, MS Nutrition Diet video I put out just about a week ago, um, it, it should be high up on the list in, in my videos, and you can you can check that out. So that was the first question. Um, I hope that, uh, that that's um, uh, helpful to the people listening online. So... I'm going to do another one. Um, so I've got Sabby Netter that wrote in a question, how do I get a stretch in my legs more uh, to help with spasticity? And so spasticity is really where opposing muscle groups are no longer playing nicely together. So when you want to uh, move your leg one way, the muscles are also trying to move the other way, and they're doing it at the same time. And it can cause spasms and cramps and limbs that are hard to bend, and it's, it's very painful and kind of horrible. And it's very common in multiple sclerosis. Now, um, th this viewer writes in and, and says, how do I stretch my legs more? And there's a lot of ways to do that. And I honestly would leverage the Internet. Sorry, guys, I'm scooting around here in my chair. Um, I would really leverage the internet. You can go on YouTube uh, and find innumerate videos on stretching. I mean, quite literally, if you type in stretching, you're going to find like list after list of videos, and you can find a stretching program on there that suits your needs. So one way to do it is, is to look up some calisthenics or some stretching exercises and follow along on the, on the YouTube. That's probably one of the, the easiest ways. There are many other things that can be great for stretching. So if you've ever participated in Pilates, Pilates is awesome for stretching. Yoga is fantastic for stretching. And so considering uh, doing a yoga or a Pilates class or doing a video for either one of these, those would be great ways to do it. I think that particularly during the winter months in Ohio where, where I'm uh, living and practicing, it's super cold out and that makes spasticity worse. And I recommend that people stretch in the morning upon waking even before you leave your bedroom. If you could do even just five minutes of stretching, holding each position for 30 seconds at least so your body figures out what it's supposed to be doing, that could be really, really helpful. And it, it, it stands to reason that you could wake up in the morning and throw on a yoga DVD or, or jump online and, and YouTube and watch a, uh, a yoga YouTube video and follow along. And, and that can help a whole bunch. I also think that it's helpful to do it more than once during the day. So some people benefit from stretching when they wake up, stretching halfway through the day, and stretching before they go to bed. And again, you can change up how you do it. You can stretch at work. You can stretch at your desk. Uh, and, and these can be very, very helpful. Keep in mind that the longer that you sit still, the stiffer you're going to get. And so if you're sitting at a desk typing for eight hours during the day, um, you're going to get really stiff and your legs are going to get tight. And so you might need to get up and walk around. Uh, you might need to forcibly get up and stretch your legs. You might need to do that every hour. But that was a um, that was a great question. Let me see if there's another one on here. Um, I I went through and I kind of uh, made a list here in hopes that I can kind of go through these. So um, 
yesterday I did a live stream and it was a lot of fun. I really appreciated you guys jumping online with me. Um, in that live stream, I talked about a concept of therapeutic inertia. And I also talked about uh, treatment style. So your doctor's treatment style. Um, and someone wrote in, you said litmus test of life twice. What is that? So they wrote Lipman test, and I probably wasn't very clear. I'm talking about the litmus test. The litmus test of life is my way of saying, how are you doing in life? And are you pulling away from activities? Are you backing away from doing things or not? So sometimes because of MS, um, you don't go out to eat with your girlfriend. Uh, you, you don't join the boys uh, for a night of poker. You don't attend your kid's soccer practice because walking in the grass, that distance is too far. You opt not to go to the grocery store or you, you, you give up on going to church on Sundays. And that's failing the litmus test of life. That's not an attack. And it's not a new deficit on your exam. And it's not a new spot on your MRI. But to me, it's more important. Um, and it counts. And so when I'm talking to someone with MS and I'm trying to figure out how they're doing, I'm listening for the litmus test of life. I'm listening for their engagement in life. And if I identify that they're not doing well, that they're pulling away from activities, that they're failing the litmus test of life, that's actionable to me. That makes me want to jump in. That makes me want to make a change. Um, we're going to have to pick apart why. Um, and we, we may need to talk about their disease modifying therapy or their symptomatic therapies or their participation in, in activities, or they may need to be involved in some support group, or they may need to go to an exercise class. My point is, I think it's too narrow minded. It's too, it's too narrow minded to only think about have you had an attack and is there a new spot? That's, that's not adequate to manage this disease. And so that's why I talk about this concept of litmus test of life. I hope that makes sense to you guys. So I've got, uh, now this person's uh, screen name is F Nordley. So I, if I said that wrong, I apologize, F Nordley. Um, they write in, does paresthesia ever go away? Uh, and that's a good question. The word paresthesia is a doctor word. It sounds pretty fancy, paresthesia. So paresthesia simply means numbness and tingling. And when you have an abnormal sensation in your arm or your face or your body or your leg, um, that's a paresthesia. And it could be a numb and tingly. It could be an achy burny. It could be, it could be a painful paresthesia that actually has a term called dysesthesia. But these are doctor words for change in sensation. So the question is, could those go away? And sometimes they go away and sometimes they don't. If you have a, an MS attack, um, and let's say it's attacking the back of your spinal cord where those sensory fibers go, and it causes inflammation there, and you get a paresthesia, say, from the waist down, just as an example, and you get treated with steroids and the inflammation quells and goes away, depending on how much damage was there and how much it recovers will determine if the paresthesia lasts or not. Now, all too often there's residual damage. So I talk about residual damage. It's actually brain damage or spinal cord damage. And you may be left with permanent paresthesia. And that stinks. Um, that's a terrible thing. Um, and there are ways of trying to address it. So if someone has an attack and they get numbness of their leg, a paresthesia of their leg, we give them high dose steroids and they recover. But let's say they don't recover all the way. Let's say they recover 70% and they're left with 30% numbness in their leg. We're going to use physical therapy to help retrain their walking if they need that, because sometimes when you can't feel, you don't move very well. And we could use symptomatic medicines to try to take the edge off the paresthesia, depending on how much it bothers them. So we may, we may use off-label medicines um, for other purposes, like a common one is Neurontin, Gabapentin. And Gabapentin, for some people, can help with paresthesia. Now, let's pretend that even after that, you still have numbness. What do you do? My opinion is you use it as a reminder of why you do all the stuff you do to fight MS. You use it as a reminder as, as to why you exercise as part of your lifestyle, why you watch your diet and supplement your vitamin D, why you take a disease modifying therapy and why you avoid tobacco smoke, because you don't want to have another limb that gets numb. And, and I want you to use that residual numbness, that residual deficit that's, that you're stuck with as a reminder of why you're fighting. 
And if you say, why, why am I doing all this? Well, it's because you don't want to have something else get numb. And that's just my opinion. I, I think that that's a very, very helpful uh, tool um, as we try to um, as, we, as we try to grapple with how we interpret and, and uh, manage this disease. So let me see if I can find another question. Bear with me, guys. I thought I was more organized when I was copying these questions down. All right. So here's a question from Ichabod. So Ichabod13, um, a great viewer, um, writes this wonderful question. Thanks as always, Dr. B. If I understand correctly, there's only one FDA-approved drug for SPMS. Um, I would imagine that most patients would benefit from being on a DMT instead of, of only one. Why would a neuro ever want to label someone with SPMS? And it could lead to insurance issues or possibly um, going without a DMT. So, so Ichabod, that's a great question. There's a lot to talk about there. So first off, there's no drugs that are currently FDA approved in the United States 2019 for secondary progressive MS, save this drug called mitoxantron that nobody uses anymore. There is a drug called saponamide that may seek FDA approval for SPMS. And I have some major issues with that. First of all, I don't believe that there's a discrete phase of MS called secondary progressive MS. I, I, I don't medically believe that's true. I think about people as having a relapsing form of MS that can enter into a progressive phase, but they're still at risk of having attacks. They're less likely to have attacks, but they still can. And I want to remind everyone that many, many of the medicines that are currently available, particularly the newer medicines, are effective at treating progression. There was a study done that I dis dislike a whole bunch because what they did is they took people with progressive disease state off medicine. And what they found was 30% went on to get worse. They had progression of their disease, whereas before it seemed to be uh, controlled. And so my first comment is I think it is terribly narrow-minded and, and inappropriate to label someone with SPMS, particularly if there's going to be a situation where as a result of the label, they don't have access to medicines. Um, these newer medicines, they do more than just decrease frequency of attacks or stop attacks. They do more than just stopping new spots on the MRI. In addition to that, they also slow down progression. And, and I think that we should be using them. Now, if there's a drug that becomes available for SPMS, I share your concern, Nick, about it. I share that all too, um, all too likely, an insurance company could say, well, if you have SPMS, it's the only drug that will approve for you. And, and then other drugs would be off-label. And that would be a disaster. Um, so I share your opinion. I think it's a great question, and I appreciate you asking it. All right, let's see what other questions I, I uh, got here. So Sarah writes in, hi, Dr. B. Well, hello, Sarah. Uh, I'm 26 years old, and my husband and I would like to start a family soon. However, I just had my first uh, infusion of Ocrevus at the beginning of this month. When would be the best time to start trying? How long does it take for the medicine to be out of your system? Awesome question. A lot to talk about, Sarah. So first of all, women develop MS more often than men, three times more often than men. And the average age of onset of MS is 30, which means that many, many people who get MS are women of childbearing potential. And so this is an extremely appropriate question for this population. It's an extremely appropriate question to be considering. And I think the best time to start talking about pregnancy and fam excuse me, family planning is the day that you meet a patient in a family. And I think that it needs to be an ongoing, constant conversation with the human living with MS and their care provider, because we want to be planful. Now, Having MS doesn't mean you can't uh, get pregnant. Absolutely not. MS has no bearing on fertility. MS has no bearing on your ability to have a gorgeous, wonderful child. You're not at increased risk of birth defects or spontaneous abortions because you have MS. That's not true. So there's no concerns there. However, the medicines that we use, the medicines can interfere with pregnancy. Uh, that is possible. And so we have to be very planful. 
Now, the specific question is about Ocarvis, and so I'm going to talk about that. But maybe I'll do another live stream or, or a video where I talk just about pregnancy. I do have a couple of videos on my channel. I have one in specific where I talk about the risk for children to get MS if you have MS, and another video that actually talks about pregnancy. And so if I remember, maybe I'll throw a link uh, down in the description when I edit this later. But the question was, how, what about Ocrevus? So when you receive an infusion of Ocrevus, it lasts in the body for four and a half months before it leaves the body. And so we wouldn't want to conceive a child during that four and a half months because you have the, the drug floating around your bloodstream and it would, uh, you would subject the fetus to, to that drug. And we wouldn't want that. And so one way of thinking about it is if, if you are wanting to conceive and have a family and you've been given Ocrevus, you're going to want to wait at least four and a half months before you try to conceive. Now, many doctors are going to recommend a full six months, and that's not a bad recommendation. The idea here is you get dosed every six months with Ocrevus, so waiting six months and then not getting redosed, but getting a green light to become pregnant is a decent idea. Now, a couple other quick comments. And by the way, I see Scotty Rosencrantz online. What's up, my man, Scotty? It's good to see you. Uh, thank you for joining us from uh, West Virginia. Um, so uh, when you decide that you want to have a kid, um, and you're living with MS and you're going to conceive, particularly if you're going to be coming off therapy, you have to really, really be dedicated to having a kid. And if I can speak plainly, you have to have a lot of sex. I'm being serious. You don't want to just have sex once a week or twice a week and then see if maybe you get pregnant. No, 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 no. We're talking about having some serious attention to detail and you got to really, really work hard because the time that you're off your therapy is a dangerous time. You're unprotected in many respects. And so I don't want someone to stop their disease modifying therapy and casually have sex once a week and then see if they get pregnant. No, no, no. I think that you have to be planful um, and it has to be on. All right. That was a great uh, question. I really appreciate uh, that Sarah asked that question. Let me see what other ones I had prepared. Yeah, this is a good one. So Erin um, writes in and she says, can you talk about motor fatigue and weight training? Is it helpful or does it hinder? So uh, in a past life, I was a competitive power lifter. Um, I, uh, I love lifting weights. Um, I don't do that anymore, but it was a big part of my life for a long time. And so um, I particularly like this question because it, it reminds me of back in the day. And the question has to do with motor fatigue. So some people find that when they start uh, to use their body, whether that be weightlifting or running or just walking really fast, um, or in, in their, their body heats up, that it starts to short circuit and they develop something called motor fatigue. So if they have motor fatigue, then uh, it makes it hard to keep on keeping on. And the question is, what do we do? Well, first of all, don't shy away from exercise. That's the wrong direction. But what we want to do is we want to combat against motor fatigue. There's actually a medicine uh, called Ampira or 4 amino um, or in, the, in Europe, it's Fampira with an F. And this medicine doesn't work in all people uh, with MS. It works in about a third and a half of people. But when it works, it buttresses against heat sensitivity and motor fatigue. So simply by taking that medicine, uh, you can you can have at it and you can work out in the gym, whether that be lifting weights or whether that be um, running or what, what have you. The, another really great tip is to cool your body. And so there are cooling vests out there. Uh, in fact, there's a company that recently sent me some cooling vests. I haven't even opened the packaging yet, but they're supposed to be super thin, like less than two pounds. And you wear them against your skin under your clothes and it allows you uh allows you uh to stay cool and at least this particular company and i haven't tested this out yet they're claiming that you could exercise hard for 45 minutes before your body got heated up now there's all kinds of different cooling vests and you can find them at sporting goods stores in fact um there's all kinds of uh, programs with the national MS society and ms association of america to help defray the cost of a cooling vest or to get you a cooling vest for free uh, and so you can cool your body down Weightlifting isn't bad for you. Uh, it's not bad in MS. Any type of exercise that you're willing to do is a really, really good idea. And if you notice that heat sensitivity makes that hard, then I think that you just need to be planful. Uh, one other idea is to consider swimming. Now, swimming and weightlifting are not the same thing, but the advantage to swimming is that it's constantly cooling your body in the water. So as you heat up, uh, convection pulls heat off your body. So great question. Hope that helped you guys. All right, what else do we have here? So 
I've got a question from a woman named Susan uh, who asks, she says, can you have arm and leg uh, that are affected with pain and numbness and burning and weakness um, if you only have brain lesions um, and no lumbar lesions? So the, the question here is an interesting one. Can you have uh, can you have arm and leg involvement and only brain lesions? And the answer is absolutely 100% yes. But she asks about not having lumbar lesions. And I don't see lumbar spine lesions very often at all in MS. When you think about the spinal cord, we typically divide it in three segments, the cervical spine, the thoracic spine, and the lumbar spine. And that's in order of the probability of having lesions. You're way more likely to have them in the cervical spine, second most likely to have them in the thoracic spine, and very unlikely to have them in the lumbar spine. So yes, you can have arm and leg involvement with just brain lesions. I see that all the time. But if you haven't had a cervical spine MRI, that's the next thing I would think about or a thoracic spine MRI if just your legs are affected, because you absolutely can see that. I've got another question uh, that I saw here from Cindy Roper. Cindy writes, is it possible to have a flare-up while on Ocrevus? If so, would steroids continue um, to be the next course of treatment? So Cindy, yes. Disease-modifying therapies are birth control pills against future events. And the goal is to not have attacks. But none of these therapies, including Ocrevus, work 100% in all people. And so if, if you keep that in mind, yes, you can have attacks while on Ocrevus. It's not magic. It doesn't make all attacks go away for all people. And if you have an attack, 100% yes, the thing to do is to take steroids uh, to hasten the recovery and to quell the inflammation. That is totally on point. Now, Divine, um, who I adore, Divine is a viewer who does a lot of comments. I, I, I absolutely love what she shares. She has a question here um, about the language of MRI, and I'm not going to answer that right now. I'm actually going to spend some more energy and, and try to break that down maybe in a video. So, Divine, that'll be coming. Now, I do have videos on my channel about MRI, and if you guys haven't checked that out, um, I have an entire playlist on MRI. And there's one that starts on MRI basics where I do talk about a lot of the, the questions that she has. What is a T2 lesion? What is a T1 lesion? But I'm going to put some extra effort into this one, Divine, and I, and I may uh, do an updated video where I talk about that a bit more. All right. So Melanie Parker writes in, and this she's writing in from Massachusetts, uh, question, what happens with lesions in the white matter of the brain versus the gray matter of the brain? Well, when I was in medical school, I was told that, that MS was only a white matter disease, that there were no gray matter lesions, which is incorrect. That's false. The issue here is that when you obtain an MRI, the way the MRI works, just the way it obtains a picture, it makes it very challenging to see lesions uh, in the cortex. That's the gray matter. They're there. Uh, they're just not easily seen. It's kind of like when you take a picture with your camera, you don't see infrared light. There's infrared light in the room. You just can't see it and the camera can't see it, but it's there. There are gray matter lesions in the brain. We know this from autopsy studies and we know this from very special um, research techniques um, where, we can, where we can kind of bring them out, um, but they are there. And cortical lesions uh, are very, very relevant in MS. Uh, cortical lesions are now part of the diagnostic criteria. Uh, and so we've added that in. And cortical lesions can cause problems uh, we believe that they're probably uh, also contributing to difficulties with thinking and memory, they increase the risk for seizure. There's a lot of things that can happen. Absolutely. All right, guys. Um, I've got a couple more questions here that I've uh, prepared, and then I'm going to be jumping offline uh, because it's time to go out and enjoy uh, Chicago on St. Patrick's Day evening. So what else do we have here? Last, last prepared question. So Gigabyte, and that's a cool name. Hi, Gigabyte. Gigabyte writes, can MS affect your bowels? I have terrible IBS in recent years, going uh, multiple times a day, uh, along with a constant urge to use the toilet. The usual medicines for IBS prescribed by doctors um, and the traditional diet don't seem to be helping. So the answer to the question is yes, MS can affect your bowels because the bowels are controlled by the nervous system. And it is possible that you can develop difficulties with bowel function uh, in the setting of MS. And it's something called neurogenic bowel. And so if you're suffering from neurogenic bowel, there's a lot of things that can be done. 
Um, I have a video on my channel where I talk about bowel hygiene. So uh, proper bowel techniques that can help uh, what you eat when you try to move your bowels, et cetera, et cetera. And so if you haven't seen that, that might be a video to check out. Um, another pro tip is to talk to a urologist, a urologist with a U. And you might say, well, Aaron, that's kind of a weird thing to say because urologists only deal with, with bladder, but that's not the case. Um, the urologists I work with generally uh, want to talk about bowel, bladder, and sexual function, all three. And they're oftentimes related. So for example, if you're having really bad constipation, it can impact your bladder. And, and so one of the pro tips, if you're really struggling with bowels, is to get an expert opinion from a, a caring urologist. That can be really helpful. Guys, I've been online for about 30 minutes now, uh, and my time's coming to a close. There's 153 people that have joined, and that's really, really cool. I've been looking over at the chat, and there's a lot of great questions that are flying by. Again, I'm going to take a moment and look through that. I also saw there was a discussion about how we might collectively as a community do this a bit better. Um, and I didn't get to read everything, but I'm looking forward to reading through it uh, and figuring it out. And I know my man Cameron is online and he's looking at this as well. And so hopefully together uh, we can come up with a, a plan, uh, maybe uh, like I mentioned earlier with moderators. My name's Aaron Boster, uh, and thank you for learning about multiple sclerosis with me. It's my goal to energize you to empower you and to educate you and to raise your game uh, despite being impacted by MS. It's MS Awareness Month and as I've mentioned, I'm committed to jumping online and live streaming as often as I can this month to help bring you MS education. And until my next video or my next live stream, take care and have a great day.